and in the dock by three others who have pleaded not guilty to impeding his apprehension or prosecution. Our court's correspondent Frank Graney has this report, which some listeners may find distressing. It's been six weeks since Roisin Lacey opened the prosecution's case to the jurors and today she began her closing address to them. To remind them of how Patricia O'Connor died, blunt force trauma to the head from at least three blows. She also spoke about the lack of forensic evidence in the house where it's alleged to have happened and the car Kieran Green told Garthy he used to transport her body to Wexford. Mr Green initially told Garthy he used bleach and a scraper to clean up blood in the house and Ms Lacey said he also told them he got rid of the car's boot liner. She dismissed his initial claims of self-defence and told the jurors no defensive wounds were found on Ms O'Connor. And a man in his 40s has died after being hit by a truck in Cork. It happened at around 1.15 this afternoon on the main Cork to Kinsale Road. The driver of the truck was uninjured but treated at the scene for shock. Guard here appealing for witnesses to contact them. That's it for now. More in an hour. News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA. You can find our lowest car insurance price online. Guaranteed. Scattered showers, some of those wintry in parts of Ulster and Connacht. Lowest temperatures of 1 to 4 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Off the ball. This, this is News Talk. Now then, we've got a busy show this evening. Andy Lee, who will be in the corner alongside Tyson Fury for the Deontay Wilder fight on Saturday in Las Vegas, is with us this evening. We have Keith Wood and Rory O'Connor after 8 o'clock, looking ahead to events at Twickenham. Rob Harris will talk to us about the Manchester City ban and the football show. We have Manchester United at Stamford Bridge this evening. We'll keep you updated on that between now and 10 o'clock. Dan McDonald in studio, the opening weekend of the League of Ireland. Dan, hello. Hi, Joe. Richie McCormick, hello to you. Hello, Joe. 53106 is the text number. We are at off the ball on Twitter. How was the opening weekend, Dan? It was 5 1 0 wins, Joe. Thrilling, I would <laughs> one say. 1 0 to the insert. Favourite club name here. Storm Dennis was the big winner. Well, yeah. I mean, like, the weather wasn't much of an excuse on Friday, I don't think, really, um, for the game. Certainly, I was at some dark dirty. It was actually a decent game. The second, the second half was the decent level. Anyway, um, yeah, Saturday, Bowes Rovers, the highlight of the weekend, was a bit of a non event, really. Um, you know, last minute drama and brilliant for Rovers, and they enjoyed the celebrations. But I suppose as someone just going to it, sort of. You know, initially to report it and, and hopefully, you know, report an event. Um, the whole thing just didn't really work out, you know. I mean, the TV coverage being lost because of the wind. I pretty much left the house thinking I wasn't going to go ahead, expecting, you know, at any minute to just be turning back almost. Yeah. And then suddenly realised they were they were going ahead with the game. And, I mean, if the conditions during the match were fine, I can, I can guess, I can see why it did. But just, I don't know, just a bit flat, really. You know, as, as an opening weekend, like, they, they've... They've had a balls of it, really. You know what I mean? Like, like in they, what they, way? well, moving uh, the game. Yeah. Well, I mean, it didn't need to be moved. So, so there's, there's a there's a there's a fixture computer, of course, that does the fixtures. But obviously, you know, there's always planning that does goes around these things. Like they've done things this year. They've quite sensibly, I would say, for example, the four teams that are in Europe, they they've made sure that they're playing each other on the same weekend, so they can move one round forward from July to the summer. I've been saying this for a couple of years, so it's sensible. That's a, you know fair play to them. That's something that's been done. It shows that obviously there's always an element of planning. There's there's a reason why you, very rarely you see two title chasers playing each other in the last game of the season. You know the opening weekend there's always a thinking behind it. Have a good game, and for some reason this time round they decided to go for both. Bowes Rovers, even though I know that Bowes did not want that as an opening game. They had changed security firms, they wanted a bit of a lead it into the opening match, you know, uh, and Rovers up first was going to be a bit of a test. Also as well, there was instances with the Cup semi-final last year, which meant that Bowes basically knew that whenever they played Rovers on a Friday, the local guard had indicated it was going to be moved away from Friday to a Saturday. But it appears that the fixture list went out without maybe thinking through some of these things. So the big announcement when the fixture list was released was Shamrock Bowes will play Shamrock Rovers on the opening day of the season, Friday at 7.45 p.m. And then, of course, you know that was before clearly going to the guards who said, well, that game's not taking place on Friday. We, we need to have this game on Saturday. So then it was moved because of that. Um, and then you had like the weather. That's just unfortunate. You can't account for that. Um, but then you you know the, the weather meant that the game couldn't be shown. So you've the opening weekend. You've lost your highlight. It's been moved from its natural date. Bowes Rovers will sell out at any time of the season. It doesn't need to be the opening game. And if anything, the big build up into it probably just heightened some of the 
I don't know, heightened some of the scrutiny and attention on it. So it just could have been handled a lot better from a, from a number of elements. Some bad luck. As I said, I wrote a piece today. Some bad luck, some bad planning. And that's basically, it. you know, the weather really, really punished some, uh, some decisions that probably shouldn't be made in the first place. And, of course, there's headlines and there's, there's you know, images of, of you know, post-match sort of, Fights, basically, you know, amongst the Indian fans. You don't even know if they're all even at the game. Um, and, you know, clearly there is a security. The, the logic would be that if you have the game on a Saturday or in a daytime, it's better than an evening time because, you know, the, the natural inclination you would think is, well, it's resources, but also people getting boozed up throughout the day and whatnot. But really that didn't really work because they met at the centrepiece of a Saturday afternoon. and Stupid you know, people are going to be stupid people no matter what day it is and no matter what time of day it is. Unfortunately, that's true. You know, that I think if that game was at 10 o'clock in the morning, people who want to have cause aggro will find a way to cause aggro. And it's generally outside the ground, not in the ground itself. So I would question the need to have moved the game in the first place. But I accept that Bowes knew there was a few instances at the semi-final last year. They were, they were on their last warning. And then some things happened at that game. They like, Well, they knew that that was going to be moved. But why it had to be the first game of the season, I just don't understand it. Okay. I don't understand it. So that, that was just a bit of a low because I mean you want to have like it's actually a good weekend to launch the league. It's a it's a non no Six Nations mm. game. Uh, there's been the Premier League winter break, so it's you know it's not that active. So it's actually probably a quiet sporting weekend. So it's actually a great platform, you know, to announce yourself and to arrive. And again, I go back. It, it wasn't handled very well, but I do think people. I mean, this would have been predated new sort of people coming into the FBI and. I think they're aware, you know, I think the lessons probably will be learned from it, so I'm not going to bang on about it too yeah, much, sure. you know, but I think in future, obviously, having that game in the first weekend is just a complete no-no. So the images of the fighting outside the stadium popped up on my phone, certainly on Twitter, across Saturday afternoon, and it looked like a bunch of idiots who had watched a bad Donnie Dyer film and mm. thought they wanted to pretend they were part of the English 1980s hooliganism scene. Yeah. Pretty embarrassing, actually. So it looked like... 30 people tops. Is this a routine thing? Um, like, I mean, Richie, you know as well. I mean, yeah, like around Bowes Rovers games, this does happen. You know, and there, there have been games in the last year where nothing has, in the last, in recent That's years, three, where, where years nothing ago. has happened. You know, but there are times where it does happen. And um, I, have, I, I, mean, I, I do have a certain, certain sympathy with, say, the, the Guardi or whatever, because I mean, I was down there early on Saturday and I, bumped, you know, I was chatting to a couple of guards who were just walking down laneways and whatever. Like, you know, they don't know where it's... It's generally not really, as I said, in the ground itself. You might, in the ground itself, you'd have someone, you know, hopping to pitch and trying to cause... But, like, that's just... I, I don't want to be too po-faced about that because, like, this is just an atmosphere. It's passion. There's games. Sometimes it's going to spill over. People are going to be a bit... Like, it it's probably is an aggressive environment. It's not for everyone. But, like, that's to a degree as much as it is normal I've seen but it's around the stadium and those things where people on the street are going about their business that's deplorable you yeah. know and that's it, I've, it I've, seen, I've seen stuff image. happen like it, it's not just it, it doesn't happen in the stadium you're a both fan we should yeah, say yeah it, does, it doesn't happen in the stadium per se I've seen things amongst idiots kicking off as far away as heading towards um, O'Connell Street who people who've, who've filtered I remember a Saturday afternoon match people were filtering away down towards uh, back towards town mm. and it basically kicking off around there but it doesn't happen usually within the ground there'll be a bit of an atmosphere there'll be a bit of an edge within the ground within the ground's fine it, and again it's not just confined to Irish games to think that this has been swept under the carpet in England and elsewhere is a complete lie this kind of level of stuff to the level that we saw of those pictures and videos and stuff doing the rounds on Saturday, that happens pretty much every English league ground. It's not right. It shouldn't happen. No. But it's not an Irish thing and it's not a Dublin Derby thing. It happens. No. No, it's, yeah. it's, at all, it's at odds with our sporting culture. It I is think, very you know, much so. But like it, at the same time, I, I don't want to... Like, to I think it, it portrays the image sometime of the, this Bowes Roberts game. It's like... Uh, it's like Beirut or something in there, you know. Like it's it's crazy, it's chaos. It's it's not actually, you know what I mean. There's just like there's there's tensions, you know. It's 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 certainly, you know. There's if your sensitivities are offended by you know language and chanting and certain things, then it mightn't be for you. But like That's it's not. Fine. But That's it's not. Fine. But it's it's really like as I said. You know, but sorry, sorry. It's clearly arranged to, to a degree yeah, between yeah. people. So you, like like for example, I, the most. Can I just come in? Yeah. You, you, sorry. So you you use the line deplorable. Mm. which it was, because the footage I saw was somebody sitting in traffic and what's going on in front of them is a disgrace. Mm. And that needs to be clamped down upon. So if it's not Bows and Rovers, that doesn't happen. 
He has. The main. Oh, the, 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 the other games, the, the there will be instances. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's not. It's not exclusively about Rovers. No, League. far from. No, I mean that. You know, stuff that can happen around the grounds. Like I, I feel like it's one of these ones. If you start naming examples, people are going to offend that you name examples. Know, but you yeah. know, no, there's been instances thing. where okay. you know buses have had issues going to certain grounds and that type of thing. But again, you see. Uh, the reason I'm making the point about uh, you don't even know over at the game because naturally you, you hope that like that that clubs spot people that are clearly identifiable in these videos and ban them. And are the clubs that sophisticated but, but, when it stops? Well, to people I in? think you know. The ban- but the point is that like they can they can meet away from like, you can't ban them from society. Like they, you can't ban them from being within a ten mile radius of the ground. I'm just saying that if they were banned. Stuff will happen around the game, so like I mean, we, we end up going into terms like, well, it's about education, it's about this. I don't know actually how you clamp down on it. Like the rivalry is one that exists now. I talk about deplorable. Like in recent years, you would have had the odd sort of, and this definitely does happen because I've has happened because I mean I've heard it and, and heard the accents. You would have like fans coming in from England for the Bowes Rovers game. Right. There's alliances with certain clubs. Um, I think was it Bury in one instance, was it or one or two like, that actually come in for the game and some Wrexham, fans Wrexham, Wrexham, so. Wrexham is the one actually that I think I'm thinking of. You know, who who come in for the match. You know, and I mean. <laughs> like that, I think for people who don't go, it's definitely, you know, it it, it just paints an image that's very un, unappealing. And what I would go back to, like like in, for example, in Tallis Stadium now, um, and I'm tempted to say here when Chamber Covers played balls in Tallis Stadium, it's a modern stadium. It's it's well laid out, and I can't recall any real instances of trouble around there. I mean, there has been the odd issue around Tallis, but again, you know, the Bowes fans get Lewis out. I think if you have modern facilities in Stadia, you can manage things. Well, there's there's complications good. with Daily Mount that just it's in the middle of a very busy yeah. area as well. And you know, on the edge of town, whereas Bose fans, for, to give people an idea, if you're travelling out to Tala for an away game, you get the Lewis out there and essentially you're ferried, sorry, I have to speak into the microphone, uh, you're ferried by the guards, more or less, to and from the Lewis the stop. Table. Oh. That was the main thing they were doing. <laughs> you're just ferried to and from the Lewis stop up and down to the ground. Okay. And there's usually, like, there's a few cat calls and stuff like that from people who are in the, the flats and apartments up near us, but yeah. there's nothing major but again as Dan says it's a question of facilities it's a very hard thing to police in and around the area of of uh, of Fisborough mm-hmm. um, whereas Tala just given the way it's laid out and given the way they have to actually take a bit of a schlep out there it's mm. it's better managed it's, oh, okay. it's, it's a delicate one because you watch there's a, there's a, what's the, the Copa 90 there's this company that made a video a couple of years back on the Bowes Rovers derby and as I said the passion and the atmosphere that can be generated by the game it makes it one of the best experiences you know, to, to you know to go to around Irish sport, but there's always a line that it can spill across to go to something completely different that like f- is used to fuel you know very negative stereotypes. You know, and there can be a hysterical tone to that sometimes. But I mean, th- that footage you saw is real. Yeah. You know, what I mean that happened. And uh, for someone sitting in traffic, it's very real to them. They're not necessarily putting everything in context of the broader picture. They just go, well, I, I associate everyone that goes to this game with that, mm-hmm. and that's that's a problem. Okay. Joe, how dare you? There are no bad Danny Dyer films. <laughs> I stand corrected. I stand corrected. Can you name three Danny Dyer films? Oh, what's the one where he's in the West Ham firm? Was that, that's Green Street. Green Street, yeah. Green Street, yeah. Five stars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Name one that isn't football related. It's a challenge, isn't it? When I ask the question, I don't know the answer. <laughs> but I want the Joe to know, obviously. Yeah. The next text is too tempting to pass by. Hi guys, did any of you see Kevin Coban in a very nice white, thick, <laughs> knit polo neck today? That surely will put a smile on people's faces, says oh Tony. Oh my God. Well, I think we all smiled, Tony. Absolutely, we did. It reminded me of the video for uh, Last Christmas. I can't um, wait for the Christmas album. It's yeah. a parody of Last Christmas. <laughs> I saw Jimmy Bullard replied under Instagram saying, oh, killer. He's <laughs> like, leave it out. <laughs> and about 10 laughing faces, Jimmy Bullard. Yeah. I want to hear more of your Jimmy Bullard impression. <laughs> well, that's all you're getting. <laughs> you get. Jimmy Bullard and Danny Dyer sort of <laughs> merging into one. It was out, so it's in Hello magazine today. Uh, yeah. It's in Hello, yeah, it's online anyway if you go looking for it. Is, have you been through the photos? Oh, yeah. They're wonderful. It's like, is it, is it like a Christmas Wonderland vibe? No, it's a winter wonderland. <laughs> yeah, they're, well, they're sledding. Well, it's in Canada a lot. Like, it is, it's, not, like, it's not a set. Is he definitely <laughs> it's in Canada and weather. not a set? Yeah, it's, it looks like yeah. actual snow and an actual polo neck. Right, so, yeah. Okay. Listen, good on him. Good on him. So, 
uh, let's start. Very sad news. Uh, yeah. The passing of, of Harry Gregg will be marked this evening in Stamford Bridge. Yeah, both Chelsea and Manchester United are wearing black armbands tonight in tribute to United goalkeeper Harry Gregg, who has died at the age of 87. The Northern Ireland legend passed away and was often referred to as the hero of Munich after helping pull survivors from the wreckage of the 1958 air disaster. Gregg was named goalkeeper of the tournament at the 1958 World Cup for his performances for Northern Ireland, while former United boss Alex Ferguson says he's deeply saddened by Gregg's passing. His former teammate Bobby Charlton says Gregg deserves to be remembered as one of the greatest names in Manchester United's history. Speaking to Oshin Langan in 2008, Greg was keen to see the others who perished in Munich be remembered. Everyone wants to talk about my teammates, about the team I played in, but there were a lot more people on board that aircraft. There were nine great journalists, eight of them who were killed. There was a Yugoslav diplomat. There was a, a supporter called Willie Satinoff who paid his own, the only to go there and he lost his life. Those people have got to be remembered as well. My teammates were wonderful friends, but in my head, I always think the journalists and the other people, their children must have said each time there was a celebration of the Busby Babes, what about my dad? Those things are terribly important to me. Uh, we should note that interview with Harry Gregg has just been re-uploaded as a podcast on offtheball.com. Very well worth mm. listening back to recorded back in 2008. Really interesting um, guy, you know, I, 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 like a, a lot of his interviews on Munich were generally fascinating because he came at it from a different angle. I think actually he would have been quite critical of Manchester United as a club as well. He felt that he didn't do enough in the years after, and I think he had this line about you know he'd listen to uh, other people. I don't know who he was aiming his barbs at, but other people speaking about Munich as though they were there. And he was sort of, you know, he was just he didn't just sort of go along with the flow in terms of, you know, how he spoke about it. He had a very, I mean, he, he went back in saving people and, and you know, yeah. he'd lived through it, um, but always managed to, I don't know, just, just come out with a real thoughtful sort of way. And like, it's just, and this is sad, you know, like all these great memories and I don't know how many survivors there is of that team now, you know, just obviously, you yeah. know, Bobby, Bobby Charlton and a couple of others. But um, mm. yeah, I thoroughly recommend anyone to sort of, listen to that old interview or seek out any of stuff from his back catalogue because um, yeah, he had a lot of interesting stuff to say. Team news is in from Stamford Bridge. Yeah, United seeking a first Premier League win in four games tonight. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's side have also failed to score in their last three league outings. New signing Odio Nagalo is on the bench tonight. United line out with David De Gea in goal. Uh, what's now become an almost customary back five of Aaron Wan-Bissaka, Eric Bailly, Harry Maguire, Luke Shaw and Brandon Williams. Fred, Nemanja Matic and Bruno Fernandes are in midfield with Daniel James in support of Anthony Martial. For Chelsea, Willy Caballero continues in goal at the expense of Kepa Ariza Balaga. It's a back four of Rhys James, Andreas Christensen and Tony Rudiger and Cesar Azpilicueta in midfield the trio of N'Golo Kante Jorginho and Matteo Kovacic with William and Pedro in support of Michi Batshuayi kickoff is at 8 o'clock Thoughts on this one Dan? Um, yeah look, it's, it's sort of a, I mean it's, it's a great opportunity for Celt- or for, Ch- Celtic, for Chelsea I think you know just to really cement their their status. I think it's hard to be optimistic that, that Manchester United will do anything. Yeah. You know, it is, it, is, it is one of these fixtures that, I mean, it's a real sort of cliché sort of six-pointer, but it can, you know, it can be a real momentum swinger for whatever way things pan out. Mm. Although, obviously, um, the whole Man City situation and, and whether fifth place is the Champions League spot, whatever it might be, it's something we're going to have to analyse in time. Yeah. Um, but in the here and now, while it is four places, um, it's a significant match, but for, for Chelsea, it's a great chance. The, um, thought, so. On Sky Sports News all day, the way they've advertised this game is that it's Keane and Carragher reunited. Mm. Which I have to say I thought was good. Clever. They've been building this game up like it's the top two meetings. They've been at Old Trafford and Sky Sports News since four o'clock. They've gone big on it, yeah. Interviewing like Graeme Lasseau and Lee Dixon who'll be doing the commentary for uh, the US for NBC. Uh, Gus Poyet's been interviewed. Uh, Martin Tyler was interviewed as early as half four. I'm going... It, there seems to be a lot more on this game than I thought there was. Mm. Or, or is that just an illusion, though? This is the thing. Like uh, uh, Some of these big games that we've had in recent weeks, because the, the title is just over, like Arsenal-Manchester United, just these games that... They're great games on paper, but if you're, an, if you're advertising your pundits as the main story, that probably says it all, yeah. doesn't it, about the actual match? It does, yeah. It's on Sky, I think that's the main attraction of this game. Is it? I thought we'll I never have, noticed, I would have yeah. thought. So um, Pep Guardiola, I think we were interested to see what he was going to say, mm. and he's going nowhere. It's understood 
Guardiola has told his players he won't be leaving because of their two year European ban the club are appealing against the punishment which was handed down by UEFA on Friday for breaching their financial fair play rules Guardiola's contract you might remember runs until the end of next season it's believed Guardiola told the City players whatever league we are in I will still be here even if they put us in League 2 I will still be here this is a time for sticking together perhaps more key City CEO Ferran Soriano told the players trust me like I trust you this will be dropped yeah, I'm not so sure. We'll talk to Rob Harris on the football show about all this. There is the legal side, which is complex and tricky, and Rob will talk us through some of the minutiae there. I will do that after 9 o'clock. And then I think maybe more fascinating to us is what's going to happen to Man City. So will Pep stay when they maybe are in a division lower or not in the Champions League? And yesterday, oh, the papers were pretty unanimous, actually, that the three big flight risks in the short term are Raheem Sterling, certainly, who Man City want to sign a 450 grand a week contract, but that is now on hold. Mm. And then De Bruyne, who's 29 years of age and probably will find it trickier than a 25-year-old Sterling to spend two years out of the Champions League. He's on a 300 grand a year contract. There's certain and bonuses, I think, attached to his contract that suggest that he needs Champions League football. Okay. If he doesn't, he's off, yeah. That's and Laporte point. as well. Laporte was the other one. 300 grand a week, Laporte's... Uh, mm. set to earn. So they seem to be the three um, immediate flight risks and then there's Guardiola. I mean this business of I'm staying no matter what it does have the feel of a holiday romance <laughs> that you say we're going to stay together no matter what and then reality starts to set in. Pep told the City players whatever league we're in I will still be here and they're listening the players there listening well we won't be. <laughs> <laughs> like, whatever. That's grand but just to let you know Pep we won't be here in League yeah. 2. Um, yeah, to, I mean, what else are you going to say? Like, they're in the middle of a season, so no one is going to come out and say, well, I'll be off because of this, you know? <laughs> yeah. like, Good So, in light of the news, I'd just like to confirm, I'm done. I'm but if the, the season's market. done, I am out of here. So, they're going to say this. I wouldn't read much into it. Like, um, he, even, like, you know, it was, wasn't Sterling's agent, I think, suggesting he was going to go nowhere and mm. whatever. They're, they're clearly, I mean, there does seem to be this confidence from the club that they're going to get off in some shape or form. But it does seem like, and I know you're probably going to talk about this later right. on, it's not going to go across it, but right. like the, the, their case does seem to be, from what I can gather, well, you know, the problem was with the process and how it was handled, rather than actually fighting the fact that, that they weren't in breach of the rules. The, right? um, yeah, the, so. the, the attack to Cass apparently is to say that the independence of the adjudicatory uh, committee or whatever that's involved in UEFA, they're not as independent as they should be. Mm. And by that rationale, Tarek Panja, I think, was pointing out on Twitter earlier on, almost every uh, similar um, punishment can be contested if this is overturned by yeah. CAS because if you've got an IOC disciplinary committee who are funded by the IOC but independent of the IOC, you can say, ah, well, look, you're sure in payment of the IOC. We shouldn't have this ban enforced by you or similar to the FA or similar to the, Interna the Federation of International Hockey or whoever it might be, that this could throw any number of sporting decisions yeah. into tumult because uh, cities say that maybe they've broken the rules but the way they've found the way there isn't necessarily on the level. That's the amazing thing. They haven't really ever come out and denied what Der Spiegel put in the paper last November. So one of the most damning aspects of the accusations against Man City is, for instance, there was a £65 million deal with Etihad mm -hmm. and emails obtained through hacking and then put in Der Spiegel. Email suggests that of that 65 million, Etihad, the sponsors, only gave 8 million and Sheikh Mansour picked up the tab for the rest. He was like, I'll pay the other 57 million. Completely against the rules, you can't bankroll the losses. So they've never actually come out and said, oh, that didn't happen. I don't think Sheikh Mansour has come out in any great way and said that didn't happen. As you said, Richie, Man City's uh, defence thus far seems to be, yeah, you got us, but we don't like how you got us. So yeah. we can't let this stand. Yeah, that does seem to be the base of it. But and and we're always used in football, I think, to the initial harsh point. Actually, in other sports as well, you have the initial harsh sanction, and then naturally it's rolled back on. Well, your Saracens, you know, Saracens well, has been the interesting maybe, one. Well, this is yeah. There's there's a there's a theme there that maybe you know maybe this is going to be applied now. But I just think the questions it raises because like whatever, but you do like you have the other clubs right as well, the other Premier League clubs who actually, when it suits them, have gone in and been. Man City's ally, like the big six have clubbed together to get certain deals for themselves and you know they can't really take adopt sort of a moral high ground stance because they're in with City on a lot of stuff you know in terms of breaking how the Premier League is structured and the equal distribution of wealth and so on they're very much in the same bed as Man City so what happens if City suddenly get a very like this, this is upheld 
And then City did City start making noises then about well, I mean, breakaways and mm. you know, breaking away from the Champions League and whatever. And who comes with them then? Yeah. You know, where do other clubs go? So I think whatever happens, I think this is going to be a significant moment because it's 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 a it's a in terms of tensions, there's almost like battle lines being drawn. Mm -hmm. And UEFA probably have to stand over what they do. But UEFA, I always feel, are always very cage. They're always cautious about offending the super clubs because they still hold a certain amount of power. Sure. So it's uh, there's, there's layers to this one, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be talking about it plenty more again, I'm sure. Andy Farrell then? Yeah, he's named a 36-man squad for Sunday's Six Nations meeting with England at Twickenham. No Gary Ringrose, of course, he's still recovering from a broken finger sustained in the opening round win over Scotland. His Leinster teammate, Will Connors, is retained, as is the other uncapped player in the squad, Tom O'Toole of Ulster. Farrell will name his side for the England test on Wednesday. Uh, Bevan Parsons, meanwhile, has been omitted for the remainder of Ireland's women's Six Nations campaign. The winger scored tries in both the wins over Scotland and Wales, but she's taking time out to concentrate on her leaving cert. Katie Fitzhenry returns from Seven's duty to take Parsons' place in the squad. Uh, best non-footy Danny Dyer movie is Severance. Cracking movie, and I'm not a Danny F Dyer fan, says Dave in Galway, shockingly. I, I imagine a lot of these are going to be straight to DVD. Severance. Never even heard of it. Yeah, nor have I. <laughs> I was looking through his... You're looking catalog. at his IMDb page during the middle of the show, Joe. Yeah. It's not great, is it? No, it's, I thought it would be better because he's such a high-profile actor. Because he's made a lot of crap. <laughs> yeah. yeah no, and he's done not. Danny Dyer's Deadliest Men, which is great entertainment. Yeah. Uh, Gigi Buffon, says Terry, famously stayed with Juve when they were relegated. Look at where they are now. A lot of that squad did. Damn. Del Piero did as well. Uh, flowing, flowing blonde locks... Nedved. Nedved. Nedved, yeah. Mm. Tresgate did as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, City can still pay them loads of money as well. So, I mean, there are ways in which players will stay, but I think the point with someone like De Bruyne, who's 29. 29. <sighs> Two years, costly. They're going to get... A, it, this will be settled at a year, won't it? <sighs> you, I, 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 think, I do have I, a feeling that it might be yeah. something like that, yeah. A year is an easier sell to certainly a sterling. Uh, Rory McIlroy then? Uh, yes, he had to settle for a share of fifth place in his first tournament since returning to the top of golf's world rankings. A two over par final round meant he slept out of contention and ended up three shots behind the eventual winner, Adam Scott. The Australian finished two strokes clear of the rest of the field. Did you watch any of this? Uh, I didn't actually know. Um, this was brilliant last night. Really, yeah. Oh, it so sounded good. like it was yeah. top class. It was no. really good. Uh, Riviera has never been as firm or as fast, so around the greens was causing players a nightmare. And uh, it's interesting, Scott went on to win it. McElroy and Scott about five holes in, six holes in, were, just went too long of a green and both had to chip on. It was like an upturned saucer green and they both didn't get onto the green. The ball rolled back to their feet. That was where they both made a lot of trouble. Then they both eventually chipped on. McElroy put it to within two feet, 11 inches and then missed the putt from two feet, 11 inches and then tapped in for a seven, triple bogey. Right. And then bogey the next hole and he was always in trouble from there. Whereas Adam Scott, didn't three put when he got onto the green, didn't bogey the next hole and kicked on and won the tournament. So it was, but like it was not a worrying last round. Because I'm, I'm obviously have Rory in the mind from reading part three of his, yeah. his Paul Gimmage piece yesterday and he actually spoke a lot, didn't he, about last rounds, various last rounds, going head to head with, with Brooks Kopke and then the, even he referenced a previous one with Adam Scott in 2013 which actually brought momentum into 2014. So it's clear even some of these fringe events, he takes something from the maybe the head to head or the, the aspect of it and I'm wondering is there is there anything to this or was it just this is just easing his way into the season oh no he, he was angry with himself mm. like at one stage he gave the pin a smack walking off the green which is unusual for him right yeah he usually wouldn't be that type he might um, shake his head a bit look at his caddy Harry and almost go look at the line again and say oh that didn't make sense but he was just angry at a certain Impressive. stage because I think he felt like he should have won that tournament. You know, he was the best player in the field. He's back to world number one. Who, like, Matt Kuchar was around him. Adam Scott hasn't played since December. McElroy absolutely looked like the favourite. Should to be win more this. ruthless, basically. That's what you're saying. But more, cl more clinical, I guess, you know, in that Probably, position. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like, realistically, yeah. By the standards he set himself, you know. And it was interesting, um, even a couple of weeks ago, Ronan O'Gara made the point when he was talking about kicking. Because he, he was saying how against Northampton when he was very young, he missed penalties under pressure in a final. And he made a really uh, great point, which is, and probably applies to McElroy as well, you can brush that under the carpet because pressure only comes on a handful of times over a season. And McElroy can still win lots of events. Mm -hmm. But when the pressure is really on, he has to find a way to yeah. find his best golf. No, it's, it's going to be an interesting year, I think. You know? I, I still think he, he will win a major this year. Yeah. He, there is an intensity about him which was not there 
certainly for it was been, it's been here about six six to twelve months or so, but previously mm. it wasn't quite there. So he looks like a guy that has winning in his, in his mind. Like the like Augusta can't come quickly enough. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah basically. and all the questions that come with it. Well, yeah, I'm sure he's going to enjoy that part. Uh, last story or two, Rich? Uh, yeah, bad news for Ulster. This evening, fullback Matt Faddies has been ruled out for the rest of the season. He requires surgery after sustaining a shoulder injury at the weekend. Faddy started and scored Ulster's second try in Saturday's 26-24 loss away to the Ospreys in the Pro 14. And Cork defender Kevin Crowley has suffered a fractured shoulder and he'll miss the rest of their Allianz Football League campaign. He was forced off late in their victory over down in round three. Cheers, Rich. So Tyson Fury against Deontay Wilder is uh, without question the uh, boxing event and probably the sporting event of next weekend in many respects in Las Vegas. Andy Lee will be in Tyson Fury's corner. We're going to talk to Andy Lee next. Off the ball on News Talk. This is OTB AM. 